Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now, system on a chip designers have a problem. Main memory, the RAM on your mobile phone, is actually quite slow. Now, to solve this problem, they do a thing called cache memory. Now, if you don't know what cache memory is, please let me explain. Now, you're probably quite surprised that I've said that main memory is slow. Of course, this is all relative. A hard disk is slow, a CD-ROM is slow. But let me give you an illustration. The average mobile uh, CPU is clocked at somewhere between 1.5 gigahertz and 2.2 gigahertz. Now, the average RAM module in your mobile phone is clocked at just 200 megahertz. So you can see a big difference in 1.5 gigahertz and 200 megahertz. Whenever the CPU wants something, it has to talk to a device that's running 10 times slower than it is before it can get the information back. Now, in CPU terms, that's an absolute age. It has to sit around waiting for something, and therefore that affects the performance. Okay, I'll admit that's an oversimplified view of the problem. However, that is basically the, the issue that every system or chip designer has to cope with. Now, because of things like double data rate memory, which can send two lots of data per clock, 200 megahertz suddenly now equals 400 megahertz. And in fact, the latest low power DDR3 is actually about eight times the base rate clock speed that can push the data out to the CPU. In fact, the uh, low power data rate four uh, memory modules are, are working at effectively the same CPU frequency is 1.8 gigahertz. So if the CPU is running at 1.8 gigahertz and the memory effectively is running at 1.8 gigahertz, there shouldn't be any problem. Or should there? Well, in fact, we've got to remember that modern day CPUs have four or even eight cores on them. So those eight cores are all accessing the same one set of memory banks. And therefore, there is a contention here on who can get the data and when they can get it. So in fact, even though it's running at 1.8 gigahertz, because there are eight CPUs trying to get hold of the data, actually, it's still a lot, lot, effectively a lot, lot slower. Now, this is actually a very well-known problem in computer science, and it's what's known as the von Neumann bottleneck. Now, if you watch my video on assembly language and machine code, you'll remember that von Neumann was one of the key players in developing and designing what is a modern-day computer. Now, the von Neumann bottleneck is basically when the CPU is waiting for data in a resource that's slower than it, that creates a performance bottleneck, where, in fact, the system is running at the speed of the slowest device, which in this case would be the RAM. Now, there are several ways around this problem, and the most popular is cache memory. Now, cache memory, what is it? Well, basically, it's a small amount of memory that's actually on the CPU itself or right next to it. And what that means is that when it wants data, it can go and get this memory at the same speed as what it's operating. So if it's operating at 1.8 gigahertz, it can get it at 1.8 gigahertz. It's running at 2.2 gigahertz, it can get it at 2.2 gigahertz. And not only that, every CPU core has its own cache memory. So there's no contention about who can get access to it because they all have their own little cache memory. Now, I can see you thinking, well, if that's the case then, Gary, why isn't all memory at cache memory on the CPU at the same speed as the CPU? Well, the basic answer is price. Cache memory is very expensive. The fabrication process is very difficult and very complicated, and to get large amounts of memory onto a chip is very, very expensive. So therefore, when we're talking about cache memory, we're talking about just maybe 64K or 80K or 128K, very, very small amounts of memory per core on the CPU. So how does cache memory work? Well, basically it stores a copy of information that's in the main memory. And when the CPU wants a particular piece of memory, it says, hey, cache, do you have that? And it goes, yes, I've got it. And therefore it can get it at a great speed. And that's called a cache hit. However, sometimes it will say, do you have a copy of that memory? It goes, no, sorry, I don't have that. You have to go to main memory to go and get it, and that's called a cache miss. Now, the greater the cache hits, the greater the performance. The more cache misses, then the lower the performance. Now, as you can imagine, there are a whole bunch of different ways of filling this cache to make sure it has the optimum memory in it, the optimum information in it. Now, one of the systems they use to get that optimum information is to split the cache in two. They split it into data cache and instruction cache. 
Now they do that because the instruction cache is actually easier to fill because normally a computer program executes one instruction, then the next one, then the next one. So you pretty well know that the next instruction could be the one after this one. Now there are things called branching, which means the program jumps to another place and that will be a whole different set of cache, but it's actually pretty easy to work out what the next instruction is gonna be needed. So for example, on the Cortex-A72 core from ARM, there is 48K of instruction cache and 32K of data cache, and that is for every one of the four cores on the chip. Now, another technique that cache designers use is to use multiple levels of cache. So this cache right next to the CPU, running at the best speed ever, just maybe 32, 48K of memory, is called level one cache. Now, after level one, you can have level two cache. Now, level two cache can be measured maybe in megabytes, four megabytes, let's say. Now, that is shared across all the CPU cores. However, it's a bigger pool of memory, and therefore, again, there is a greater chance of having a cache hit. But because four megabytes is expensive to build, it's actually slightly slower memory. It's slightly cheaper memory, making it more feasible. In fact, on some systems, for example, the ARM architecture chips that are put into servers, and AMD makes server chips for ARM, and Qualcomm make chips for ARM. Now, those chips actually use a level three cache, and that may be even as much as 32 megabytes. Now, there's one other piece of this jigsaw we need to talk about. How does the CPU know where in the cache memory is the data that it needs from main memory? And the way it does this is basically it uses what's called a hashing function. It takes the address that it wants in main memory, applies a hash to it, and that gives it a location in that 32K. Every time you put in the same address, you get the same answer. And what happens is, is that each address will give you cache location one, cache location two, like cache location three, and then that will go through. And when it gets to the end of its 32K or 48K, whatever it's got, it has to loop round again. And so therefore, for many, many RAM locations, you have one cache location. Now, of course, the problem comes about when you want to cache two things in the same cache location. You can't put two things in there at once. So there's another thing which is called a two-way cache two-way associative cache. And what that does is it gives you two slots for every memory address. And now when the CPU goes to look there, it has to look between, is it in the first one? No. Is it in the second one? Okay, I'll use that. Now obviously that's much quicker than looking through 32Ks worth. In fact, you can actually get four-way and eight-way and even 16-way associative cache, caches. But of course the problem is there is the balance between the complexity of the chip the amount of power that takes, because we're running on mobile phones here, the amount of power that takes and the performance gains. So let me quickly sum up for you. A cache is a small amount of memory that runs at the same speed of the CPU and it's there so that the CPU has a local copy of the most important bits of information, the next instructions to execute or the next bit of data that it wants. And it's much faster than going out to the main memory. Now, the bigger the cache, the better well organized the cache, the greater the performance. A smaller cache, no cache even, will mean lower performance. And caches can come in three levels. Level one, L1 is a small one on board the chip, maybe 32, 48K. Level two, maybe four megabytes. And level three, maybe 32 megabytes. So next time you look at which chip you're going to choose for your smartphone, maybe you should look to see how much cache it's got, because that's gonna affect its performance. Well, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, please don't forget to follow me on social media. You can use the comments here below to tell me what you know about cache memory. Is it important to you? Have you ever even looked about the cache memory of the CPU in your smartphone? Also, don't forget to use this link here over at the Android Authority forums where you can talk to me about cache memory. We can have a discussion there if you want to. And of course, don't forget to stay tuned to Android Authority because we are your source for all things Android.